dear colleagues, our plenary session is approaching its uh, conclusion, but we still have uh, some questions on the agenda related to the European Protection Order. I have received information that some of you, either during the presentation or during the second part of this event, will leave the premises. I would like to wish uh, uh, a good uh, journey home to those who are leaving early. Thank you uh, once again for being uh, together with us, uh, for sharing your advice and practical information. I hope that we uh, will meet in the future, but I will, I will uh, say official farewell uh, later. I would like to give would like to give the floor to the, to a representative uh, from Italy. Luca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ah, here it is. Perfect. Good morning, everyone, and uh, it is a pleasure to be here. It's been a pleasure over the last two days to um, be able to uh, exchange uh, ideas with. Uh, the real practitioners, those that are meant to uh, make sense of the strange things that uh, we um, prepare in Brussels as legislation. And um, it is my pleasure today to speak about one such uh, uh, original piece of legislation, which is the European Protection Order Directive, um, which um, the, the term for transposition of which has recently expired and therefore is um, uh, slowly becoming part of our uh, legal systems um, through implementation. Um, first of all, um, I would like to start by thanking the organization for having invited me here. It's been uh, a wonderful conference in a wonderful setting. Perhaps also a word about uh, about why I'm here, um, because it, it may seem bizarre to have a representative of one member state speaking about this. Uh, in reality, in a former professional uh, capacity, I was working uh, as national expert in the Secretariat of the Council, where I have been responsible, among other things, for the legislative process leading to the adoption of uh, the directive on the European Protection Order, together with uh, my colleague Stephen Kras, that many of you will be familiar with. Um, so it is in this uh, uh, ancient uh, capacity that I am uh, here today to try and explain briefly what is in this uh, directive. Um, I've tried to keep it simple and I will uh, explain in very general terms the content of the directive, um, highlighting some issues which uh, um, may be of interest uh, in relation to the implementation phase, which is uh, ongoing in uh, many of your member states or has just been uh, finished in a number of others. Um, for uh, the, f the fact that it's only since a few months that, that this uh, instrument uh, should be fully operative, uh, I am not in a position to give you any uh, uh, operative information and, and I mm, think that that will be for another occasion but uh, uh, right now what I, the best I can do is explain to you what this directive is about. Um, a little bit of background uh, because this directive um, has a little bit of history to it. Um, in 2009, uh, while we uh, were uh, under the Swedish presidency uh, of the Council, the last one before the coming into force of the Lisbon Treaty, the incoming Spanish presidency uh, was considering the possibility of uh, presenting a project on uh, uh, protection of victims. Uh, it is an area in which uh, uh, Spanish law is particularly advanced uh, with some sophisticated instruments and uh, the uh, idea was to try and find a way to um, uh, include uh, uh, victim protection orders in the European circuit of uh, uh, mutual recognition. Um, so uh, in September of 2009, uh, together with the incoming Spanish presidency uh, and the secretariat, we started looking at possibilities to present a member state initiative uh, in this field. Um, 
meanwhile, the Treaty of Lisbon entered into force and things became a little bit more complicated. Um, you, you may know that it was practice uh, in uh, presidencies of the Council before 2009 that each presidency had a little bit of a flagship project and this was supposed to be the one of the Spanish presidency. After the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, and member states' initiatives were no longer uh, in, in the hands of a single uh, member state, but need to be presented by at least a quarter of the member states, so at least seven. So um, in December 2009, when uh, the Treaty of Lisbon entered into force, um, the Spanish presidency looked for uh, co-sponsoring by other member states that were willing to uh, uh, become uh, co-presenters of the project and uh, the member states that eventually agreed to co-sponsor are the ones listed here. Um, what uh, this project told us, uh, and this goes in general for a lot of things I'm going to say later, is a lot of things about legislation under the Lisbon Treaty. It was really a very good uh, school on how you do uh, European law uh, under, under the new rules. And the first thing we learned was that um, uh, even uh, when uh, member states come up with uh, ideas for uh, legislative instruments, they have to uh, present an impact assessment. They have to present a, a in writing a justification as to why uh, this piece of legislation is necessary, why it is proportionate, and uh, why it does respect uh, uh, the principle of subsidiarity, which was done and eventually came to the presentation of the um, proposal and uh, its discussion in the Council uh, starting January 2010. The legal basis of this instrument is, uh, um, for the first time, we used Article 81, uh, 82, Paragraph 1 of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which allows the EU to um, adopt uh, instruments uh, concerning judicial cooperation in criminal matters. I've underlined these words uh, because um, it is uh, the core of, uh, of the problems uh, uh, concerning uh, the content of this uh, directive and the negotiations which have led up to its adoption. Um, in particular, letter A of Article 82, paragraph 1, uh, uh, allows the European Union to adopt legislation to ensure recognition throughout the Union of all forms of judgments and judicial decisions. And here again, uh, we have the question of uh, uh, what is exactly a judicial decision, apart from its more, um, how can we say, uh, evident uh, meaning. And uh, you will see uh, how in the European Protection Order we have found uh, a solution to this question, which which was then also used in other instruments. Um, now, what is the problem? The problem is that uh, when we talk about uh, uh, protecting victims, uh, it is uh, an activity which uh, our member states uh, uh, tackle in a number of different ways. Um, there are uh, those uh, systems that uh, uh, ensure this protection in a purely criminal uh, environment. Uh, as an accessory to the criminal proceedings concerning the offender uh, through decisions which are strictly uh, contained in the criminal law uh, jurisdiction. Uh, then again, there are systems that divide uh, the criminal proceedings from the protection measures, ensuring that protection measures are taken in a civil setting. Then there are systems, again, where victims' protection is an administrative matter. And then there are systems where there is all sorts of mixtures of the system. So the complication which we had at hand was to ensure circulation of decisions which were taken in very different forms. And very different forms with also with very different procedures, which means with very different uh, uh, levels of procedural guarantees for what concerns both the uh, victim and for what concerns the offender. So how do we do this? Um, the first uh, attempt was to um, adopt a, a wide notion of criminal matters. So to say that um, if a measure to protect a victim of a violent crime uh, was taken in relation to a um, behavior uh, of a offender of a alleged offender, uh, which could amount to a criminal offence without any direct reference to an ongoing criminal proceedings, since there was this uh, underlying idea of a criminal offence, anything related to that could be considered criminal matters, regardless of whether the protection measure had been taken uh, 
in a civil proceedings, administrative proceedings, or as uh, the majority of cases in criminal proceedings. Uh, this idea did not fly. Uh, it was uh, an interesting attempt to look beyond uh, the uh, uh, borders of, of what uh, uh, criminal matters really is, but uh, um, the solution was not acceptable for, for a large enough number of uh, member states and not for the European Commission. Uh, and therefore, we had to, to revert to a more uh, traditional interpretation of uh, criminal matters. And the way that it was done is that simply the directive in its Article 2.2, uh, 2, where it uh, speaks about the scope of, of the instrument, uh, refers to protection measures as decisions taken in criminal matters, substantially leaving member states to um, adopt uh, and adapt uh, uh, their systems uh, to what they consider to be a criminal matter. Uh, this was done while at the same time um, presenting, and this was a commission initiative, a proposal for a um, regulation concerning mutual recognition of protection orders taken in civil matters. A second instrument which uh, uh, aims uh, at uh, complementing the system in a way to cover all possible protection measures and to make all these decisions, regardless of how they are taken, um, the object of recognition outside the member states where the decision has been taken. Uh, this regulation has been adopted. It is uh, Regulation 606-2013, um, which being a regulation is obviously directly applicable. How does the system then work in practice? First of all, um, if you look uh, briefly at the, the colored boxes, this is an attempt at trying to explain how this is supposed to work. Um, the member states are free to decide how they are going to uh, execute in their uh, member states, when they are executing member states, when they receive a European protection order, how they're going to execute the measures. They can do it uh, uh, according to their national law, therefore assigning uh, the competence to a criminal uh, authority, an administrative authority, or a civil authority. What the EPO aims at doing is ensuring that uh, uh, criminal and administrative measures um, can be sent to another member states in order to be recognized in any way which ensures an equivalent level of protection. The way this works is, um, since we have a constraint of uh, having legislation on recognition of judicial decisions, is to make sure that the EPO is always taken, uh, is it, uh, always issued by a judge. Now that can happen in two ways. Either it is already a judge or a judicial authority issuing the original protection measure, or if the protection measure is issued by an administrative authority, uh, then this protection measure will have to be um, validated uh, by a judge, which means that it is a judicial authority which on the basis of the national protection measure finally issues the European protection order, which is uh, used then for recognition. If on the other hand, the uh, original measure is taken by a civil judge, then the directive on the EPO will not apply and instead the regulation will apply. So the way it works is that if it is a civil protection order, it will be recognized by a civil judge through the rules of uh, Regulation 606-2013. To give you a practical example, um, I have browsed through a number of implementation laws and uh, um, the uh, typical case where protection measures are a matter for civil judges is the case of Germany, where uh, it is a family court which uh, is uh, entrusted with taking protection measures for victims of violent crimes uh, in a proceeding which is entirely separate from uh, criminal proceedings underlying, uh, or possible criminal proceedings underlying this offense. Now the way Germany has implemented uh, this legislation is that they have grouped together the implementation of the directive and the regulation in one single legal act, uh, whereby uh, they have uh, um, given family courts the competence to execute all protection measures, regardless of whether they are um, 
uh, sent to Germany via an EPO, so a criminal EPO, or whether they are um, the subject of an order of recognition according to the civil regulation. In all cases, it will be the civil court competent for taking the execution, uh, the executive measures uh, consequent to the request for protection of the victim. Now, what is the protection measure? Um, the idea was uh, uh, the following. Um, a victim of crime, uh, crime which is, has been committed or is in the course of being committed or is uh, likely to be committed, applies for a protection measure. And each of our legislation knows a number of uh, possible uh, uh, measure of safeguard which can be applied to ensure that uh, the uh, damage to the uh, victim uh, ceases or is prevented. Um, during the negotiation, it emerged that uh, uh, there were, uh, as common measures to all our system, basically three types of protection measures. Uh, a prohibition from entering a certain place area where the uh, protected person um, lives or works or uh, carries out a substantial part of their daily life. A prohibition or regulation of contact in any form between the offender and the protected person. Or a prohibition or regulation on the offender uh, upon approaching the protected person at more than a certain established distance. Um, for only these three type of protection measure, the agreement was found to allow the victim, if uh, uh, they decide to move to another member state, other than the one where the protection measure was issued, to request that the protection measure follow them in the, um, a member state where they decide to reside or stay. And this following is made through the European Protection Order. When can a European Protection Order be issued? Uh, the conditions are the fact that there is at national level a protection measure of the kinds listed in Article 5, which is a closed list, um, that the protected person uh, submits a request personally or through their legal guardian to have this protection measure made the object of a European protection order. Uh, this request can be made when the protected person stays, resides, or is going to stay and reside. It means that uh, the request can be made either before moving to another member state or after the protected person has moved to another member state. The idea was to allow uh, the maximum level of flexibility uh, for the protected person to request uh, continuation of protection in another member state. Um, when the request is submitted, um, the authority competence to issue the European Protection Order uh, has a, a discretionary margin to appreciate whether it is uh, uh, advisable to, uh, un to uh, start this relatively complex process. Um, and this uh, discretion was made necessary by the request of a number of member states to avoid having a situation where a protected person uh, uh, in member state A uh, goes on a holiday weekend to member state B and, and pretends that uh, he or she uh, is, is followed by uh, the protection measure, which obviously would be uh, disproportionate efforts uh, in respect to the need for protection. So the issuing authority can assess um, a number of factors, uh, including the length of time for which the protected person uh, intends to stay in the other member states, as well as the, um, what has been defined as seriousness of the need for protection. What, what that means is that it is for the judge to assess whether it is likely that the danger caused by the offender or potential offender uh, 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 exists also when the protected person moves to another member state. So how likely it is that along with the protected person also the offender may move to another member state. So uh, upon request, there is not a, a full obligation for the issuing authority to issue a European protection order, but there is the possibility to uh, assess whether that is necessary. Uh, as we said, the competence is for a judicial or equivalent authority, uh, which of course can also be different from the one that issued the original national protection measure, as we said. 
Um, there is a form in an, uh, in an annex to the directive which needs to be filled out with the details concerning protected person offender, type of measure, duration, and all the details that you can imagine. And of course, the transmission is in the form of, of, of mutual recognition instrument. Therefore, it is uh, direct between uh, judicial authorities uh, according to a list of competent authorities which the member states have to communicate the, uh, to the commission. And there is, of course, the possibility to appoint a central authority for uh, the assistance, transmission, and reception of the um, EPOs. When an executing state receives an EPO, uh, they have to, without undue delay, uh, uh, take a, a decision uh, which is not an executing decision. And here is a bit uh, of, of, of the trick of this, of this instrument. It is not a direct uh, a recognition. It is what we have in the end uh, uh, called a, so a three-step approach. Why? Because uh, there, is, there may be a gap between the initial protection measure and the type of protection measure which the executing state will be called to apply. Uh, we may have a civil protection measure in one member state which becomes a criminal protection measure in the, uh, in the executing state, or rather vice versa. So the idea was not to have the executing member state directly execute upon recognition, but rather than it take an equivalent decision according to its own national law. Um, the, uh, without undue delay uh, is... is uh, is the term used by the directive. There is no uh, mention of a specific deadline for, for recognition, precisely because procedures under national law will differ so much that it was not considered appropriate to give a single deadline for, for recognition. Now, what that means is that when this without undue delay has been uh, used by a number of uh, implementing laws, that may give rise to uh, substantial differences in the terms of application, but only practice will tell us whether that is, uh, was going to be a real problem. Um, what measure must the executing member state take? Well, the wording of Article 9 uh, uh, is uh, uh, a measure which corresponds to the highest degree possible to the original protection measure which was granted to the, to the victim, which means that, again, there is room for adaptation. Uh, the, the formulation of the protection measure listed in Article 5 may be different from member state to member state. The obligation is to ensure that uh, uh, what is taken in the executing member states um, should be uh, as close as possible to the original protection measure. There are, of course, grounds for non-recognition. Um, uh, they're listed in Article 10. It is uh, um, not a surprising list. Uh, the, the, the grounds for refusal are pretty much the uh, everyday uh, reasons that you find in other mutual recognition instruments. Uh, it must be noted that Article 10 only speaks about uh, may uh, refuse, hence only of uh, optional ground for refusal. Now, in browsing uh, implementing laws, I have noticed that uh, uh, some member states have uh, um, converted these grounds for refusal into mandatory grounds for refusal, either entirely or in part. And that, of course, is, is a question which would take us far in assessing how that corresponds to the aim of the instrument, uh, not only, of course, in this instrument, but also in other, uh, in, other uh, in the application of other instruments of mutual recognition. Uh, but it's certainly not here that we're going to uh, start discussing about that, or maybe we could. Um, there is a double criminality ground for refusal. It was not considered appropriate to come up with a list of, of offenses, especially because uh, the only list for offense that we are ever uh, capable of agreeing uh, with in Brussels is the EAW one, which certainly would not fit uh, the description of, a, of uh, the types of offenses we had in mind with the European Protection Order. So the result was to revert back to the double criminality rule. Um, it doesn't mention anything about a breach of fundamental rights. Uh, the reason why this is here and is highlighted is that there is one uh, implementing law which I have seen which has added a specific ground for refusal uh, um, following uh, a violation of fundamental rights in the uh, issuing member state. Now, we have discussed briefly uh, about this yesterday in our workshop, and it is a big issue, and it's going to become bigger in the future. Um, you may know that uh, uh, whereas for, for a long time uh, the Council has resisted any pressure to add fundamental rights, uh, grounds for refusal to its mutual recognition instruments, uh, 
uh, when negotiating uh, the directive on the European investigation order, which was the second instrument for mutual recognition uh, adopted uh, um, after the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon and not by chance, again, a member state initiative, uh, Parliament has strongly demanded and obtained, uh, uh, finally, the uh, inclusion of a ground for refusal based on violation of fundamental rights which has a very specific formulation which has been carefully crafted in weeks of, of, of negotiation. It is not a general possibility to halt uh, execution based on any uh, uh, violation or alleged violation of fundamental rights. Uh, but it is something that we in the future will have to uh, start uh, making sense of. Uh, discussions so far on, on whether this kind of refusal could apply will have to take a different turn after this precedent. In this directive, uh, there was no such ground for refusal. So the question is whether adding one in national uh, implementing law uh, is uh, something uh, appropriate and, and legally sound. Very quickly, which law applies? Uh, well, uh, law of the executing member state applies uh, to the adoption and enforcement of the new measure, the measure that follows the uh, protected person to the new member state of residence. Um, in case of breach of this new measure, it is for the executing state to uh, adopt uh, uh, any provisional measure which may be needed to reinforce the protection of the person. Uh, these measures, of course, uh, according to the flexibility which has been granted in the first place, can be criminal or non-criminal. And the executing member state has the uh, sole competence to apply any uh, criminal penalty consequent to the breach of the protection measure. Um, the competence of the uh, issuing states, and there's, here's an error in the slide, uh, Article 13 talks about the issuing member state, not the executing member state, of course, is for everything which concerns uh, the, uh, the history of the protection measure uh, at its source. Therefore, renewal, modification, withdrawal of the protection measure, uh, the original national protection measure, or of the European protection order, and uh, imposing a custodial measure as a consequence of the revocation of the protection measure. In other words, if uh, uh, the protection measure, say, not to enter a certain locality was granted as an alternative uh, uh, um, uh, preliminary measure uh, on, uh, on an offender and uh, this uh, uh, alternative measure is breached in the executing state, it is for the issuing member state to decide whether conditions apply to revoke the alternative measure and impose, for instance, custody on remand. Um, in case the protection measure is modified, withdrawn, uh, it is for the executing authority again to apply the same procedure for execution, including possible grounds for refusal. Article 20 deals with relationship to other instruments, well, and especially the question uh, is, uh, concerns the relationship with the framework decisions on probation and supervision, which may cover partially the same type of measures which, uh, uh, from the victim's point of view, are perceived as protection measures. Um, in brief, uh, uh, the European Protection Order is always disregarded when uh, a uh, measure um, is uh, handled according to the uh, framework decision on probation and supervision, which means that when uh, an uh, alternative uh, measure or alternative sanction is transferred according to these framework decisions, it is that instrument which applies and not the European Protection Order. Uh, last state of implementation. Um, as of today, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, the EGN website uh, is uh, uh, very um, clear on that, we have 14 member states having implemented the directive, and it is in the course of being implemented in further 10. Um, Again, as, it, as I've said, in, in, in preparing for this, I've had the, the possibility to, to look at um, these implementing legislation, including the one from the member state I'm from, and, and without uh, wanting to go into the question of implementation, where I, uh, I really uh, hope uh, Joachim will be able to give us uh, a lot uh, better insight, um, I have flagged up some issues which will have to be uh, carefully looked at. Um, first of all, uh, the fact that the protection measure, the original protection measure, uh, must relate uh, to a pending criminal proceedings. This is quoting from a specific member state legislation. Um, 
I think that uh, um, uh, this is uh, limiting the scope of the EPO, which has uh, in itself uh, uh, not necessarily a relationship with the pending criminal proceedings. There may be legal systems where a protection measure for a victim is taken uh, irrespectively of whether criminal proceedings are started or not or concluded. Um, the role of central authorities uh, is important. Uh, uh, there is always the uh, tendency of some member states to entrust the central authority with a lot more tasks than those uh, uh, which uh, uh, legislators of mutual recognition instruments would like to give them. Uh, there's always a the, the, the need to encourage competent authorities to do the job themselves, to familiarize themselves with, uh, with an instrument rather than uh, always uh, centralizing uh, um, the use of these instruments. The without undue delay question I've flagged up before. Uh, some member states have imposed strict terms, some haven't. Uh, the grounds for refusal as well, uh, the refusal for violation of fundamental rights, and of course the question of uh, the sanctions in case of breach. This is of course a situation which uh, will be and remain uh, patchworky in the sense that of course it depends on uh, each national system how they want to treat the consequences of the breach of a protection measure. Uh, I've seen uh, two uh, um, implementing laws which have dictated specific new uh, criminal offenses uh, con uh, consequent to the breach of the uh, measure. So they, they will have specific criminal proceedings on that. I will uh, stop here because uh, um, time is uh, running out. I will be happy to take your questions and thank you for your attention. Uh, I have a, t a question for you, Luca. I, I myself took the ground. I hope it's not wrong, in, completely wrong. We, we have a, a practical issue here when, let's imagine in Spain, a person has allegedly committed a, a, gen, um, a crime against uh, his partner, you know, and we um, release him on, on bail and we impose certain conditions. He is going to go to France. Um, according to the frame of decision you have mentioned, alternative to, yes, he, he goes to France. Later on, the partner or the wife w wants to move to France again, and she asked for a protection order. And as you've said, it, for those cases, the victim uh, has a, a, a threshold of uh, unprotected uh, scope, meaning that uh, within the context of the European protection order, you can impose the, the, the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator not to come closer to the victim. Whereas, according to the alternatives to the prison, you cannot impose that. There is a very uh, upsetting circumstance uh, for, for us practitioners because you have a, a, a pitfall there, you have a, a, a real hole there. What's your view on that uh, very practical matter? <sighs> The rule in general of, uh, of uh, uh, the application of this directive is that, as I've said, uh, once a measure has been transferred according to the framework decisions on, on probation or supervision, the rules of those instruments apply with priority over those of the EPO. Now, in this case, if there is a measure A which has been transferred to France, uh, uh, the rules of the framework decisions would apply and you would not apply the EPO. EPO. Now, the question is then, what do you do of another measure? Because that's really your, your question. Uh, can the victim apply for a protection measure uh, uh, other than the one which has been imposed as condition for bail? Uh, and the measure is, for instance, one of a prohibition to, to approach uh, um, over a certain distance. I would personally think that in this case, uh, it is not a question for an EPO, because the offender is already residing in France. So I would think that it is for the French authorities to consider the possibilities of imposing a new uh, protection measure. Uh, I, as, a, uh, as an authority in my member state where I have the victim residing but not the offender, would probably decline competence because uh, the offender, so the person that has to on which I have to impose a restriction of personal liberty is not residing in my jurisdiction. Of course, I can always impose uh, the kind of measure in case that person were to come back to Spain. But in the case you're describing, it seems to me it is more a situation where the victim would have to apply in France for a victim protection measure according to French law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca, for the elaborate presentation and for the discussion.
Thank you also for answering the questions. The next speaker today will be a representative from Germany, Mr. Joachim Zetterstedt. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not from Germany today, but uh, <laughs> from Sweden. And um, I work at the Court of Appeal in, in Stockholm in Sweden, where I am a senior uh, judge of appeal. Um, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, attend this very well organized and interesting meeting. And also thank you for having the opportunity to share some experience and uh, reflections in from my part of work when implementing uh, the directive into Swedish law. So having uh, listened to the very interesting presentation from Mr. De Matteis, I think we have a very good picture of the uh, outlines of the legal framework in, in this uh, directive. Uh, in my presentation I will have a different approach to, to, um, uh, to, to this directive, namely from, from the implementation and how, how I have uh, tackled the various questions. Uh, I mentioned I'm, I'm a judge and as a judge you don't very often, at least not in Sweden, in a court of appeal, you don't very often uh, uh, deal with cases regarding uh, protection measures. Uh, but w thinking of protection measures, um, I, I, uh, um, uh, I returned to a matter I had a, a few years ago, and this was a, a woman in her late 40s, and um, she lived on a farm outside of Stockholm, someplace in the countryside. And uh, when she was in her early teenagers, she, there was this caretaker coming to the, to the farm and working there, and the caretaker had a son. And uh, this son, he took a great interest in, in the girl. He really fancied her, and uh, over time he really got obsessed of her and uh, started to pur pursue her. And uh, this didn't end there. This went on for years. Uh, and over time she, she managed to have a protection order uh, in Sweden to, to uh, hinder him from, from contacting her. Uh, and uh, when this, came, this case came to my court, uh, this had been going on for 30 years. Uh, and uh, for obvious reasons, this woman was a very broken down person. Uh, this man had over and over again violated the, the um, prohibition measures that had been issued against him. So um, when I ha had the, uh, I was asked to, to draft some legislation to implement uh, this directive into s Swedish no, I, I thought of this woman, I, I thought perhaps this um, new instrument could be useful when uh, uh, the, the national measures are, are not uh, any more effective, like in, in this case. Um, Swedes like to go to Spain, and I thought, well, maybe she could go to Spain and bring along her protective uh, measures, and uh, this instrument would enable that kind of, of um, arrangement. So. Um, uh, I thought perhaps this could be useful after all this uh, directive. A directive, uh, as Mr. De Matteis described, was uh, presented uh, in the Stockholm program in 2009 and uh, put forward by Sweden and 11 other member states in 2010. And the basis for this uh, directive was information obtained from uh, member states. Member states have been asked to provide information on uh, protective measures and 18 member states uh, gave, their, uh, gave information and uh, uh, the information showed that each year nearly 100,000 decision, decisions, 100,000 decisions on uh, protection measures were issued in the member states each year in the European Union member states. So, um, and those protective measures were in most cases intended to protect women against uh, gender-based violence. And um, one important reason behind this uh, pro European protection order is that it, there is a gap in the union rules on the free movement of persons. And that is that uh, the rules enable the uh, offenders to move freely between member states while there is not a corresponding freedom for uh, for the victims. So it was f for that reason logical that a person that is 
protected by a protective measure also uh, should be able to uh, to to bring along uh, uh, the protection to the country where he or she uh, decided to to go to be safe um, as has been described here the european protection order is an option for a person that is protected by a pro protective measure in in, in one state to move to another state and bring along this protective measure. And the beauty of this is that the protected person will not have to explain and argue for the need of protection in, uh, in, uh, in the new country where he or she is, is going. And this is due to the fact that the European protection order is based on the principle of mutual recognition. And what is actually recognized here, it is, as Mr. De Matthias has pointed out, is not actually the, the, the decision in itself and the measures under the decision, but rather the need for protection. So if the issuing, uh, if the, the court or the prosecutor in the issuing state has, has decided that there's a need for protection, well then this has been taken as a fact in the, in the executing member state. So now I will briefly mention a number of issues that I, during my work with implementing this uh, directive, have encountered. Uh, it's not a full account, of course, but uh, some of it may be of some interest when in implementing or applying um, uh, the, the directive. And the first and foremost um, um, uh, problem or issue to face when uh, implementing this was, of course, to assess whether from, from the Swedish point of view, uh, our protective measures were to be considered criminal or not. And uh, as has been described here, there is a division between criminal and civil uh, or even administrative protective measures. So um, it's clear that neither the directive nor uh, any other EU legal instrument really contain a clear definition of what is a criminal matter. And this is possibly a little bit surprising since uh, uh, in Article 82 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the uh, European Union, this term is, is uh, used. And uh, on the civil side, there are a number of rulings by the European Court of Justice uh, stating that the definition of a civil matter uh, is uh, autonomous. That means that the concept of what is a civil matter should be interpreted primarily in the light of the context of the relevant instrument uh, the aim and the systematic of, of that instrument. Well, this was perhaps not a lot of guidance when uh, trying to implement uh, and establish um, in Sweden if, if Swedish protection measures are of, of a criminal nature. But uh, finally, we concluded that uh, Swedish protection measures are decided by prosecutors and, and courts, and thus criminal in that sense. They are using, the, the prosecutors are using uh, um, criminal procedure uh, provisions in, in the investigation. The, the, the purpose is then to prevent a person from uh, causing damage or using uh, criminal activities against another person. And also the violation of, of, uh, of a protection measure is punished under, Swedish, under um, criminal law. So uh, finally, we, uh, our assessment or my assessment was that the Swedish protective measures were within the scope of the directive and uh, of a criminal nature and thus could be used for, for, uh, for the issuing of, of a European protection order based on this directive. I also reflected on cooperation issues. Uh, this uh, directive will actually require cooperation and consultation between member states in other ways than just regarding the issuing or the execution of the European Protection Order. Uh, in the directive there are some provisions that actually highlights uh, the, the need for co co cooperation, but it maybe doesn't in, in all aspects uh, tell us how to do that. And uh, one example is when the person causing danger, that's the bad guy he's, uh, who's pers persecuting someone, um, is uh, in the issuing state and the European protection order has, shall be enforced in, in another member state. Um, if in the Swedish case um, uh, we're having a trial and uh, having to take a decision in this matter, we have to notify the person uh, about the decision. This follows already from the, from the directive. Uh, but also under Swedish law, you have to serve the decision on the person for the, for the in, in order to, have to make the decision effective. 
Um, and um, well, the solution here is, uh, as far as I can understand, that uh, you could use the, the opportunities for service under the 2000 uh, EU Mutual Legal Assistance Convention. And uh, either you can by mail serve this person, or you can ask the, uh, the authorities in the issuing state to, for their assistance in, in serving uh, uh, the, the person. And, and um, probably it would be very much in the interest of the of the authorities in the issuing state to, to uh, be helpful when, when tr and try to, to assist in, in, in the service of, of, the, of the person. We have also another situation, this was touched upon by Mr. De Matteis, and um, at least under Swedish law, and I imagine it would be the same in, in other states, that you will actually have two parallel decisions, one in the issuing state and one in the executing state. And uh, you have to, to avoid that the person is being uh, uh, pr prosecuted in, in both states. So the, the, the prosecutors or the authorities in the member states will have to, to uh, talk to each other in order to, to avoid uh, uh, that the person is prosecuted twice for the same offense, because it could be the, the same offense, of course, depending on how the jurisdiction uh, uh, reg regulations uh, are um, um, designed in the, in, in, in the issuing state. So finally, you could also imagine that there could be a need for legal assistance by video conference, and this could be the situation if the person causing danger is in a state other than uh, in the state where you have a trial, for instance, for, for executing the, the European protection order, then that could require, uh, in a particular case, that the person can um, could be heard during this uh, hearing, this trial. And then you could also, as in the serv serv service of document case, be uh, you could perhaps lean on the 2000 Mutual Legal Assistance Convention to, to carry out the video conference. One issue that uh, may possibly be subject to some attention uh, in the implementation but also application of this uh, directive is the uh, um, principle of proportionality. Um, and uh, that is uh, how long uh, can the duration of the execution of uh, a European protection order last for how, how long time uh, shall the executing state enforce the issuing state's protection measure? In this uh, matter, the, the directive is not, perhaps not so helpful. In Article 14, it states that the executing state may suspend the execution when the measure taken for the execution has lasted the longest possible time according to the law of the executing state. So you shouldn't have to execute uh, a protection order for longer time than it would have been possible under your own national le legislation. Uh, and as there are probably differences in how long time uh, protection measures may, may be carried out under the different legal systems in the member states. Um, uh, this may of course also be dependent on how restrictive the particular measures are. And um, my proposal in this regard when uh, suggesting Swedish legislation and I understand that's also a part of the, the final proposal, uh, is included a proportionality rule that was linked to the corresponding Swedish uh, rules on, on um, uh, protection measures. So inf enforcement in total uh, could not be able to last longer than it would be have been possible under Swedish law. So in practice, this could mean that if um, a protection order, order has been preceded by several earlier uh, protection orders that have been sent over from the same member state, well, ultimately, you can come to the situation where you will not, you will, of course, uh, recognize the, the protection order, but you will not take any measures to enforce it. Uh, I guess this is quite a rare situation. Uh, and uh, that, also, that is also a, a conclusion if, if you come to the issue, and I will soon finish this presentation, but that is the matter of, of usefulness of, of this, uh, uh, this um, directive. Uh, in, in, in this initial example, it's maybe a rare one with a woman who has been persecuted for 30 years, but um, in, in her case, it would be at the initial stage be natural for the Swedish prosecutor to, 
to um, issue firstly a Swedish protection measure and then use that as a ground for issuing a European protection order and send it to, in this case, to Spain. Uh, but you can ask what happens after that. Because after some time, to my belief, I'm not a prosecutor, but I'm a judge, and uh, um, in many cases there would be no, after some time, no more legal basis under Swedish law to maintain the protection measure in Sweden, since uh, the protected person no longer lives or resides in, in, in Sweden. So, um, well, in this situation, uh, it may, uh, after some time, be considered not proportionate to uh, maintain a protection measure in, in, in Sweden. And this was also touched upon the, in the early, earlier discussion between Florentina and Mr. De Matteis. Uh, this can, of course, also be due to the fact that uh, the issuing state lacks jurisdiction. But in Sweden, we, have, we, we could have jurisdiction, but it, as I said, it perhaps it's not proportionate or uh, legitimate to re re retain the, the, uh, the protection issue. So, and, and this would result in the Swedish protection order to be repealed and there also the European protection order to, to be repealed. And that would stop the enforcement in Spain of the protection measures. Uh, of course, the Spanish authorities might find it uh, necessary to uh, continue to have protection measures to to protect this woman, but that would all in that case it would be based upon the the Spanish legislation and the need uh, that the Spanish authority finds uh, necessary to to in order to protect this this woman in our example. So perhaps one solution, at least from the, from the Swedish point of view. Uh, that the protection order, if applied, will first and foremost be an interim solution uh, to be used in the meantime while a threatened person moves between Sweden and another member state. And at uh, this stage, probably the European protection order will be very helpful uh, for the protected person coming to a new country, new authorities, new language. and. Um, Perhaps that might be the director's main virtue and uh, function, and uh, perhaps that's good enough. So um, I think with this conclusion, uh, that was about all I had to say in this matter. Thank you.